Right. All right, so my name is David, and um, I'm going to present work that I did at the University of Wisconsin-Madison with my colleagues Allison Sape, Aus Albarguthi, and Bill Gay Mutlu. And our work is titled Authoring and Verifying Human-Robot Interactions. So a little bit about what I'm going to talk about. First, I will give a background on our problem statement as well as our research question. Uh, then I'll dive right into the solution, um, focusing first on what the user will experience, and then, uh, which we call the design tools, and then I'll talk about what's under the hood for the user experience, which is the analysis tools. Finally, I will end with a uh, discussion of our evaluation. So uh, to start, what situations do we envision robots serving? Uh, well, robots are social agents, and um, they interact with people in a variety of contexts, as we know. Uh, they make deliveries to hotel guests, for instance. Uh, they provide information to museum goers. And um, as an example of somebody, uh, uh, as an example of work done by one of my own colleagues, um, they help children stay motivated to read. So in each of these interactions, social norms are a large part of their success. And I'd like to um, establish this point by talking about a use case, uh, namely the delivery robot. So let's make this simple delivery robot right now. We might design this robot to start with a greeting and then um, move on right into the handoff, followed by saying farewell. And uh, some of the simple social norms that we might want to hit upon here are that, well, the robot should greet the human and also say farewell. Those are two very simple social norms that we have embedded into this interaction. So that's great. But we might also be concerned with interrupting a non-interruptible human. For instance, uh, certain humans uh, might be working in fast-paced, high-stress environments, like an emergency room. And in that instance, we probably want our robot to wait for the human to first acknowledge it before greeting the human. So we'll do that. Uh, and... Um, <clears throat> After that, perhaps the human has questions about the delivery, and so we can add to our interaction by making the robot available to answer these questions, as shown here. And so our interaction is looking like it's coming together right now. Uh, but we haven't considered some of the social norms that are relevant to each of the individual robot behaviors themselves. So let's consider the robot's handoff behavior and some of the social norms within this behavior that we need to consider. Just within handoff itself, we have various social norms, for instance, related to gaze. So we need to make sure that the robot coordinates its gaze properly. And gaze is just one example of a nonverbal norm that the robot might want to follow. Other nonverbal norms might, be, uh, might involve gesturing or how close it gets to the person, which is proximity, etc. And so uh, the robot needs to coordinate its gaze so that it looks at both the human and the package that it is handing off. Uh, but suppose that the robot also, while it's handing the package off, says something along the lines of, here you go, when it hands off the package. So then the robot also needs to use its gaze to regulate the speaking floor. And additionally, we need to make sure that it does not violate conversational turn-taking norms when it says that. So we don't want it to interrupt the human. So the research question that we have specifically is how can we enable designers, engineers, and roboticists design robots that adhere to human social norms? And our work is at the intersection of human-robot interaction and a programming languages theory area called formal verification. And we seek to bridge the gap that has, hasn't already been bridged. Prior work has been done in um, integrating human-robot interaction and formal verification to check that the robot satisfies or uh, succeeds in its task. And what we aim to do is bridge the gap in which we check to make sure that the robot adheres to relevant social norms within the interaction context. All right, so our proposed solution is to firstly create a design interface that uses formal verification to provide feedback on whether a person's designed interaction satisfies the social norms. And secondly, <clears throat> we, uh, in order to do that, we need to specify our social norms in a specific representation that enables further analysis. And this representation is called temporal logic. Now, I'm going to talk about formal uh, verification and temporal logic a little bit later on in the talk, so I will leave that for now. <clears throat> And uh, our solution is twofold. It first involves what the user sees. So we call this the design tools. The user sees what they are designing within the interface that we designed. And the user sees feedback from our system, which com comes from formal verification. 
Underneath all of that, we call the analysis tools, which um, first involves uh, modeling the design in a certain way and then involves verifying that the design satisfies social norms. So let's just focus on the design tools for right now. We created our interface called Rover that allows people to design interactions in their own authoring environment, and Rover stands for Robot Verifier. Rover uh, contains a design pane, which allows people to actually construct their interactions as uh, in a state machine-like manner. Uh, it contains a library of building blocks called microinteractions. Microinteractions are just microscale parameterizable interaction units. In other words, the smallest possible interaction between a human and a robot, or a human and some piece of technology. And yes, the microinteractions are just the building blocks that people drag and drop to create their interactions. Rover also contains a parameter pane so that people can customize their microinteractions. And finally, a feedback pane in which people receive feedback on which social norms their designs are violating. So Rover is controlled via a keyboard and a mouse. And people uh, use the mouse to drag and drop components onto the design pane, as shown here. Additionally, Rover can connect to a robot to simulate the interaction. I'd like to go back to the feedback pane. Uh, again, the feedback pane is where people receive feedback on whether their designs satisfy social norms. And so when people change their designs, the feedback pane will update. And users can click on categories of feedback and view a description of the social norm that their design is violating. For some social norms, they can hover over the feedback and see exactly where in the design the social norm is being violated. So now that we've talked about the design tools, I would like to talk about what's under the hood. Going back to our circular workflow here, we will first talk about how we need to model the design. How do we take someone's interaction design and model it in such a way that we can provide them with feedback? So let's go back to the delivery interaction right here, which I have represented as a state machine. Uh, just to recall, the robot will first wait on loop until the human acknowledges it, and then the robot will greet the human. It will answer any questions that the human has, and eventually make the handoff and say goodbye. This is what the delivery interaction might look like, might look like in Rover. <clears throat> and you'll see this again in a moment, but it's important to realize that this is the highest level representation of an interaction. This is what the user sees and manipulates. This high level interaction can be broken down into the following components. Interactions are composed of groups, and groups are composed of microinteractions. And microinteractions are composed of low level states and transitions that make up what are called transition systems. Let's start with the low-level states, the low-level transition system. This is the most fine-grained level of our computational models, where we reason about the individual actions that the human and the robot can take. So with the state that is being pointed to right now, that state might correspond to the human having the speaking floor. Presumably the human is speaking then, and the robot is listening to the human. If the robot detects speech from the human, then uh, the transition system will go to one state. Otherwise, it'll go to a different state. And microinteractions contain these transition systems. They, modular, they modularize the lower level transition systems into reusable interaction patterns and abstract away their inner workings. So users do not see the transition systems that lie inside the microinteractions. And this leaves only the input states and the output states viewable to the user. <clears throat> and the inputs and the outputs can be categorized in various ways. Uh, for this implementation of Rover, we chose them to categorize, we chose to categorize them in um, three different ways, although they can be interchanged. Uh, the user can be ready to move on in the interaction. They can be busy, or they can be unavailable or not ready to move on through the interaction. So groups represent the next level of interaction design, and they are simply containers for microinteractions that run in parallel. So, uh, for instance, with the handoff and the remark microinteractions, um, a group allows the human and the robot behaviors within these microinteractions to run in parallel, so we can use the robot's arm behavior at the same time that we use its speech behavior within the remark microinteraction. And the inputs and the outputs of the individual microinteractions are combined into the group's aggregated inputs and outputs. And um, people can use the inputs and outputs of microinteractions to compose them sequentially and concurrently within the design interface of Rover. 
<clears throat> and just remember that we, when you break all of this down into its core components, the high-level interaction that you see here is actually a complex network of low-level states and transitions. All right, so going back to our workflow, we just talked about uh, how we create the computational model of an interaction design. Uh, and now we'll talk about how we verify that that model satisfies social norms. So the first step of verification is, is to actually find the social norms that you want to verify. And social norms can come from anywhere, the literature, data, or even manual specifications by designers. And for us, social norms came from the literature as seen here. And there are many, many more that um, we could encode uh, within Rover. Uh, we just chose a small subset for the purpose of this presentation. If you're interested in seeing a few more, you can read the paper. We've included a few more social norms there. Uh, our next step, though, is to write the social norms in a representation that enables computational analysis. And to do that, we use uh, something called linear temporal logic, or LTL for short. Linear temporal logic is just the representation that enables future analysis. It is propositional logic with added temporal operators. And so I'm going to go through the operators very briefly right now. With the G operator, G phi means that globally, over all states, the formula phi holds. F phi means that phi holds at some point in the future. X phi means that in the next state, starting from some other state, phi holds true. And psi u phi means that psi must hold true until phi eventually holds. So that's LTL. And now I'm going to go through an example with one social norm, how we encode that social norm within LTL. Just going back to our delivery interaction, remember that one of the simple social norms that we wanted it to satisfy is that the robot must say farewell at the end of the interaction. And the LTL form of that is shown right here. So I'm going to walk through it. In the future, the interaction must deadlock, which is a fancy way of saying in the future the interaction needs to end. And over all states, when a deadlock occurs, the robot must say farewell. In plain English, this, bas this basically reads, when the, inter or the interaction must end, and when it ends, the robot needs to say goodbye. We've encoded all of the other social norms that I've talked about in this presentation in LTL. If you're interested in seeing them in more detail, I'd encourage you to read the paper. We include all of them there. Or you can talk to me in the demo. <clears throat> all right, so given a computational model of the design and the social norms that are encoded in linear temporal logic, we can now perform formal verification. Formal verification takes the norms in LTL as input and takes a computational model of an interaction design and puts it all into a verification engine, which is basically just software that has formal verification algorithms. This software is widely available to download online. There are various different types of this software. And what it returns is whether, for each social norm, whether that social norm is satisfied or not. And what we can, what we can do with that information is if a social norm is not satisfied, we can provide a designer with a description of the norm and for some social norms, we can provide them with where that norm was violated. And um, just to recap, this is what we show designers. So now onto the evaluation of Rover, <clears throat> which we sought to uh, figure out the benefits of feedback from verification on interaction design. Our hypotheses uh, were that feedback from formal verification will improve the following things. Time spent looking for and fixing errors ability to identify and contextualize design errors, uh, the overall effort required by designers, and the quality of interaction designs, and the ease of finding, interpreting, and fixing errors. We had two conditions within our evaluation. One pool of participants was in the assisted condition where they received feedback from formal verification, while the other pool of participants was in the non-assisted condition where they did not see feed receive feedback from formal verification. A total of nine participants uh, participated in the study, uh, aged 18 to 22, and each participant had at least one semester of programming experience. Our experiment was broken up into three phases. With the first phase, feedback was off. Verification was off for all conditions. And we asked designers to simply create an interaction using Rover without feedback. Then we locked their designs. We told them that they couldn't modify it anymore in the second phase of the, of the experiment. 
And for the assisted condition, we provided designers with feedback from formal verification and asked them to note what social norms they thought their designs violated. And in the non-assisted condition, we did not provide them with feedback, so that remained off for that pool of participants. Uh, but we asked them to do the same thing. Please note uh, the social norms that you think are being violated in your interaction design. And finally, in the third phase of the experiment, uh, we unlocked their designs and told them that they were allowed to modify them again. We turned off feedback across all participants, and we simply asked people to fix their designs. And so this represents one iteration of the design interpret fix cycle. Our results uh, are right here, and I'm only going to touch on the measures where we see significant differences. So people in the assisted condition did have a significantly smaller discrepancy be between the errors that they perceived to be in their designs and the errors that were actually in their designs. And assisted participants found it easier to find errors and interpret errors. And so overall, uh, hypothesis B and, uh, was supported, and hypothesis E was partially supported. So some of the main takeaways from this work. We've shown that we can tell designers in real time when their designs violate social norms, and we can tell them which norms they're, they're violating, which is a big deal, I think, because not everyone is a behavioral expert. So reasoning about these norms can be challenging. And we've shown that designers can more easily interpret and contextualize their design errors using this. So I think this is a pretty powerful tool. There's much left to explore, however. For instance, we can increase the model precision uh, by incorporating probability and continuous time into our models. We can um, incorporate programmatic repair and synthesis, uh, automatically fixing the social norms for people or building interactions from scratch, and affording more control to designers by letting them specify their own social norms, for instance. Lastly, evaluating these systems is challenging. It is very time consuming and changes based on user feedback are therefore slow. And so we're building an online version of this tool to get it into people's hands quicker. And I will take any questions right now and you can stop by my demo at um, six o'clock tonight. Paul, go for it. Hi there, Paul Stroma, University of Copenhagen. Hi. Um, I'm wondering how this scales, and there's kind of two aspects to that, um, because I, the way I understood it, all behaviors are at some point predefined. Mm -hmm. um, and just in our conversation now, while we're having this, the social norms of what is appropriate shifts while we're doing it. So um, that is very complex, but also as I adjusted the microphone, I was using the compliance of my hands and I was adjusting it to my body. Mm -hmm. um, and these are two ways in which we dynamically interact with our environment, where I'm wondering how your predefined set of rules scale to, well, a complex world. The predefined rules do not scale beyond the context of the interaction design uh, that someone is designing for. So the way that I envision the scaling is we would have to either have a predetermined set of social norms for each context, which is a difficult task, uh, alternatively, like I said, we could have designers um, specify their own social norms, but in that case, we wouldn't, um, there would probably be gaps um, in their knowledge, and they wouldn't necessarily uh, specify all the social norms that are relevant to the context. We could have a combination of the two approaches in which uh, we have a library of social norms from the literature, and then users can add to that. But one of the things that I'm working on right now is the ability to infer a context of an interaction before a user, um, or sorry, after a user creates their design. So the social norms are um, generated after the robot is deployed into an environment and created on the fly. So, that's so, so the utility of your tool would then be given these social norms that we've established, have I done it correctly? Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, we have one more question here. Uh, James Smith, UC Berkeley. Did you encounter any social norms that could not be encoded in LTL? And if so, do you have an example of what one of those might be? The social norms that can't be encoded in LTL uh, were mostly due to the modeling constraints that we encountered. Off the top of my head, I can't think of any that, um, other than the ones that involve probability and continuous time. So right now, we can't do anything such as 10 seconds after this event or some amount of seconds after a certain event, the robot must do something. Um, additionally, uh, I th I'd say that state space is a constraint. So unless we have a large model that reasons about the minute behaviors of the robot's gestures or head movements or gaze or speech fluctuations or stuff like that, 
Um, we can't encode those as social norms in LTL unless the model actually contains them. So I would say that it really is more of a constraint of the model than LTL. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Wonderful. Let's thank the speaker again and let's set up for David.